Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Molly Martin, and I'm the director of New America Indianapolis. On behalf of New America, Urban, American, Urban America Forward, and the National Urban League, I'd like to welcome you to the first installment of this series on COVID-19 and equitable relief and recovery. New America and Urban America Forward are so proud to come together and join the Urban League in this programming. We believe it's of utmost importance that Brown and Latinx neighbors and Brown Latinx residents and leaders are at the forefront of conversations about how to make racial equity a principle of recovery and relief in the face of COVID-19. Elena Beverly will lead us through the conversation and talk more about how today's conversation Conversation will proceed. That being said, we cannot see you in the audience. Uh, we cannot hear you in the audience, but we'd love to hear from you in the chat. If you see me go off screen, you will find me over in the chat where I will be looking at your questions, your comments, and your ideas about how equity and racial equity in, are at the center of uh, recovery and relief or not in the cities where you are joining us from. We have folks today from across the country. With that, I'm so proud and pleased to introduce Elena Beverly, who is the Vice President of Urban Affairs at the University of Chicago and leads Urban America Forward. Elena, over to you. Thanks, Molly. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining Urban America Forward COVID-19 Equitable Relief and Recovery, especially because this is our launch. It's the first of our four-part series. I want to thank New America and our partners, uh, the National Urban League, and also provide a, a generous thank you to our sponsors who have been with the Urban America Forward program from the beginning, the Kresge Foundation and the Annie E. Casey Foundation. The Urban America Forward program is an initiative of the University of Chicago Office of Civic Engagement. And since we launched in 2015, our goal has been to provide a learning exchange among practitioners across a range of, of disciplines who are all committed to furthering equity in America's cities. Urban America Forward furthers one of the university's goals of convening the best and the brightest to ensure we're having urban impact and improving quality of life. We specifically designed this webinar series to bring together a network of practitioner experts to share their efforts and learnings in this critical moment of COVID-19 crisis relief and response efforts. We know that COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on our communities. Um, we know that the pandemic has exacerbated existing racial disparities um, that has taken a disproportionate toll both physically and economically on African American and Latino communities in America's cities. So as we navigate what you could call the dual pandemics, both of institutional racial injustice and the impacts of COVID-19, we felt that there was a need to develop um, equitable relief efforts and share those efforts in this moment while working toward fashioning a more equitable and inclusive recovery. We have no choice really to harness our collective power in this moment um, to share what's working to provide essential relief and to work together to envision and engineer tools to build a more inclusive economic recovery. Uh, that's what this program seeks to do. It seeks, seeks to begin walking us down that road. The Equitable Relief and Recovery webinar series will bring together practitioner experts from eight cities, the city of Chicago, Atlanta, Baltimore, Detroit, Indianapolis, Minneapolis, New Orleans, and Washington, DC. We ask these experts to share their experiences, partnerships, uh, practices, policies, challenges, and lessons learned in this work to prioritize racial equity and COVID relief and response. So let me outline the program for today. We will begin with our distinguished speaker at the top of the program who will set the table for the discussion, followed by uh, a panel of practitioner experts who are gonna delve more deeply into the work and lessons learned. Uh, we will then have questions and reflections from our featured respondents. And finally, we will have Q&A with questions selected uh, by New America from the viewing audience. Now, while you are with us, uh, don't forget to uh, engage in questions by sending them into the chat or uh, taking this conversation online and following us with our hashtags um, and tweeting us out. But now to kick off our program, I'm thrilled to welcome Mark Morial, President and CEO of the National Urban League, who's also a dear friend and mentor of mine. 
The National Urban League is the nation's largest historic civil rights and urban advocacy organization. Mark was previously the mayor of New Orleans, president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and a Louisiana state senator. He's a leading voice on the national stage for the battle for jobs, education, housing, and voting rights. And he's been recognized as one of the 100 most influential Black Americans by Ebony Magazine, one of the top 50 nonprofit leaders by the Nonprofit Times, and one of the 100 most influential Black lawyers in America. We have a, a star-studded, uh, fully, fully impactful lineup uh, for today. Um, but without further ado, I'll turn it over to Mark Moriel for his opening remarks and context setting. Mark, thank you for joining us. Hey, Elena, thank you very much. And let me say how much I appreciate that generous introduction. And to all who are listening today, uh, let me thank uh, Urban America Forward and New America, uh, and certainly the University of Chicago Office of Civic Engagement for hosting uh, this, uh, this important learning event today. And I also want to say how much I appreciate the support of the Kresge Foundation and the Annie E. Casey Foundation, always two institutions who are thinking about the future of our country. Uh, I would offer the following. We're dealing with three pandemics in the nation. On one hand, COVID-19 has devastated our nation. It's disproportionately impacted black and brown communities. It's challenged our public health system. It's rattled our leaders. It's forced mayors and governors to step into the breach. It's necessitated an economic response, which is tantamount to a self-induced coma. Where now we've lost one third of our GDP, some 40 million people out of work, unemployment rates nearing Great Depression levels. The second pandemic is the economic pandemic that we face. And the third, of course, is the pandemic and the virus that has been with us since the founding of this nation and, and been with us since this nation was simply a set of colonies back to 1619, and that is the pandemic of racism. And each and one of these have confluenced to make 2020 perhaps the single most impactful year in American history since 1968. But for each and every one of you, for me and for the work of the Urban League and the work of all of us who are toiling in the vineyard, who are working in the hot kitchen, who want to constructively address these issues, the question is, what will we do? How will we respond? What is the call for the nation? As people have protested across the nation, they've used a time-honored American tradition, the right of peaceful assembly and the right to raise their voices and their cries and their outrage in support of meaningful change. What we cannot do is believe that we're gonna confront a set of 21st century challenges with 20th century policies with 20th century ideas, and that all we need to do is dust off yesterday's ideas and re-enact them in the 21st century, and we are going to be able to deal with this effectively. No, we must, on one hand, if we are to rebuild our public health system, it should not be put back together again. Humpty Dumpty should not be put back together again. The public health system should be built in a more equitable way. It should be built with a direct intention to deal with health disparities from pillar to post, from cradle to grave in every respect. As we look at the American economy, we see two things. We see those Americans, many of them black and brown, who cannot work from home their essential employees, their necessitous employees, or they have employees who are saying, you come back to work or else. Uh, and we have, in addition to that, the, those who have been laid off because they've been in frontline jobs in the hospitality and service sectors, you know the story. And then we have 
racism, which hit uh, the screens of televisions and internet all across the world when George Floyd was killed. We have to muster up the will. This conversation today, we should challenge ourselves. You should challenge yourself. We're challenging ourselves. What is the correct approach to rebuilding the health, public health system in America? What's the correct approach to building the economy of the future? Is it increases in minimum wage to ensure that everyone has a living wage? Is it universal basic income? It is, an, it, it, is, it is it an infrastructure program that doesn't just build highways and byways, but which also builds schools and community centers and focuses on affordable housing. Is it a new approach? Is it a new approach to, uh, to public safety in our communities that places emphasis on holistic avenues and holistic approaches, investing in young people, building strong schools, dealing with mental and community health. That's what this moment is. And for practitioners and those who are in the policy world, it is putting, if you will, the flesh on the bone. It's putting the uh, rigor behind the ideas. And, and then for activists and politicians and opinion leaders, it is about building the public will. I think that is what this discussion is going to be about, uh, and I think this discussion today is a part of a new beginning, a new beginning of how we think about these problems and these issues. Finally, we're also witnessing an absolute assault on American democracy, questioning vote by mail, knocking wide gaping holes into the Voting Rights Act, None of this is possible if America slips to become a totalitarian style regime. All of it is possible if we preserve the civic system, the system of democracy, and putting people's voices first. So Elena, thank you so much for having me today. The Urban League appreciates the opportunity to be involved, have a very powerful, meaningful discussion and look, look forward to seeing everyone again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for the, that context. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for those remarks. Now we'll turn the conversation over to our panel of experts to delve more deeply into the question of how they are answering the question, what will we do? And how they are not dusting off the old playbook but fashioning new relief efforts to meaningfully address the economic needs of communities of color in response to COVID-19. Specifically, we're gonna discuss their work to ensure family economic stability in this moment, to reinforce minority owned business, to support low income workers and essential workers and other efforts to shape a more inclusive relief effort uh, that will lend toward a more inclusive recovery. It's my honor to introduce our panel Dr. Helene Gale, CEO of the Chicago Community Trust, James Fagan, CEO of Projects of In People in Detroit, Lynette White Collin, Vice President of Small Business Gro Growth for the New Orleans Business Alliance, and Kay Sabil Rahman, President of Demos. Now, it's only fitting that we begin, for me, it's only fitting to begin with Dr. Helene Gale. Um, Helene joined the Chicago Community Trust as president and CEO in 2017. She began her illustrious career as a physician before entering the public health and global development fields. Helene has worked for the Centers for Disease Control, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the, and the global humanitarian organization CARE. Under Helene's leadership, the trust has embarked in a 10-year strategy to close the racial and ethnic wealth gap in the Chicago region. In March, when the coronavirus pandemic struck, the Trust partnered with the United Way of Metro Chicago to launch the Chicago Community COVID-19 Response Fund, which has raised more than $34 million to meet the emergency needs of the region's most vulnerable residents. The Trust also partnered with the City of Chicago on the Small Business Resiliency Fund, a $100 million fund offering emer emergency loans of up to $50,000. In partnership with the City of Chicago, 
and other philanthropic partners, the Trust is launching a Together Now Fund, which will focus on equitable recovery for Black and Latinx communities that are most economically impacted by the COVID crisis. Helene, I want to begin with you by asking just a table setting question. I shared some of your work, but tell us what you're observing. We know that COVID-19 has dramatically affected the economic stability of Black and Latino families in terms of employment and business ownership, housing, and other pillars of wealth accumulation, to say nothing of some of the wealth extracting mechanisms like fines and fees. So what is the economic impact of COVID-19 uh, on the city of Chicago and the Chicago land region? What are you observing and what types of relief efforts has the trust fashioned? Thanks so much. And it's great to be with everyone. And it's great to hear um, Mark Moriel's um, kind of table setting comments. I think that it helps to put this in, in perspective. And, you know, as you mentioned, my background is as a public health physician. I kind of thought I had uh, moved past the public health and was squarely in working on economic development. And here we have this crisis that puts the two together. And so, um, you know, it has been a very interesting journey for us. And I'll put it in the context of the fact that about a year ago, we had um, launched our, our long-term strategy for, for the trust, which was focused on closing the racial and ethnic wealth gap. And, you know, in many ways, um, as we went through the crisis uh, related to COVID-19, it really amplified a lot of the things that, that um, had made us think that focusing on the racial and ethnic wealth gap was an important focus for our organization. And as we all know, um, this crisis has highlighted the, uh, both the health, but also the economic fragility that exists in those communities. And I think that the George Floyd um, murder and aftermath kind of um, stiffened our resolve. So I think COVID highlighted the impact. And then I think, you know, post murder of George Floyd, there was really, I think, a different commitment and an urgency to these issues that I think allows us to have um, a moment of opportunity, I think, to really push hard on these issues. So in that context, as you mentioned, we helped to launch a fund um, to pro provide emergency response to the communities most hard hit by COVID. And we said that this should be really focused on critical, urgent, immediate needs and stay focused on that. Because as we know, we're, we were talking about communities that, that were already financially insecure but we wanted this to really focus on the acute needs. So we looked at food, we looked at um, housing, we looked at uh, support for paying bills and getting cash into people's hands, particularly um, some for the cash, looking at populations who would not have had access to um, CARES Act funds, uh, undocumented, for instance, because they didn't have the um, identification to allow to get that. And we know that the undocumented population was a huge part of uh, who was impacted by this. So food, house, shelter, cash, basic needs. And we have continued to do that. Although as, as this has evolved, we have continued to be more specific and pinpoint the communities where the needs were the greatest. So we started out relatively broad, still with an understanding that communities of color were being most impacted, but then increasingly focused that to where the needs were greatest, as well as which organizations um, could best meet the needs of their residents. Who were the smaller organizations led primarily by people of color who could really get into the neighborhoods while we continue to, to provide support to some, some of the larger um, broader organizations like food banks, et cetera, who were across the, the city. So we really tried to balance this. How do you look at these large umbrella organizations while we really looked at the hyper-local um, organizations that could meet those needs? I'll talk more about what we're thinking about as we come into more of a recovery phase, but that's where how we responded to what we thought were the most immediate needs for the populations that we felt were hurting the most in this crisis. Thank you so much, Helene. And I'm also glad that you mentioned um, sort of the distribution mechaniz mechanisms of how you are working with both the larger entities and the hyperlocal organizations. 
in a future uh, Urban America Forward uh, relief webinar, we are going to be talking about so that mechanics, those mechanics of public-private partnerships. So thank you for that. Um, next, it's my pleasure to welcome James Fagan, the CEO of Projects and People. He's an urban practitioner with a passion for inclusive economic development. James's client roster includes the New Economy Initiative, Rock Ventures, the Knight Foundation, Wayne State University, and the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation. James has contributed to programs as uh, uh, Knee, Knee Ideas, Motor City Mar Match, Detroit Demo Day, the Knight Cities Challenge, and Detroit Revitalization Fellows. These efforts have helped to redefine Detroit's entrepreneurial ecosystem, shift the flow of capital, diversify the region's talent pool, and create a more connected city. James was a 20, 2017 Aspen Ideas Festival Scholar and also served as the inaugural, inaugural Entrepreneur in Residence for Ford Motor Companies Fund um, and an economic mobility hub station in Detroit public schools. His firm's current local projects include the Corktown Neighborhood uh, Framework Plan, the City of Detroit's Pan Transportation Master Plan, and In Good Company Detroit. Welcome, James. Um, and I will ask you, I'm going to ask you the same or a similar question to that of what I asked Helene. What's the impact of COVID-19 on the city of Detroit? What type of economic uh, observations are, are you seeing? Uh, and what type of relief efforts has your organization spearheaded? Well, the first, even before we get into any of the work of my organization or my clients, is when you just look at what we have now come to know about who this uh, virus affects. Um, it has a disproportionate effect on African Americans and folks with pre-existing health conditions. Detroit is an 80% African American city. So when you just look at those, that data and how that has played out on our citizens, our people, which includes our entrepreneurs, but also it includes our first responders, our professionals, our hospitals, our practitioners. Uh, I've lost colleagues, I've lost friends. So in addition to our community, uh, some of the brightest and best minds that would be applying themselves to problem solving were sidelined either in death or in, in, in health challenges. Uh, and we continue to face that today. So it's just been you know, exponentially compoundingly challenging uh, to move forward as a region. Um, that said, there are a lot of things that we have been able to persevere and do here in Detroit, as we always do. Um, and, and, and often, you know, in all of our day's work, right, we can sit here, we can read our bios, we can look at the stats, and we can, we can uh, you know, step out and feel good about some of the things we've done. But when we're in it day to day, we're simply working to gain more ground or cover more ground. And so... That's usually the mode I'm in here in Detroit, but I think it is important to, you know, as we're all kind of stepping back from the last, you know, I don't know, four or five, I don't know how many months it's been now. It feels like a couple of years, right? Uh, and just breathing and for the first time, maybe taking a Sunday without your laptop or, or breathing and not just constantly being in this grind, you know, we can look at some of the things that we've done and, and give ourselves some of that space that Dr. Helene talked about of, coming out of the disaster crisis response and ourselves moving into recovery, um, you know, and then starting to have that long-term look, both within our work, our organizations, as well as our communities. And so, you know, some of the things that we look at are, you know, I had the opportunity to go to attend the Funders Network Conference down in Houston in early 2018, and they were having a lot of conversations about climate resiliency and disaster recovery and the economics of it. And one of the things that really stuck with me, they said, your, your community, your recovery will only be as equitable as your community the day before the, the storm hit. And so when this disaster hit, it was, it was, it was a gut check and, and, and a, a reality check on where is your community? What were your priorities the day before COVID really came to lay bare? because that determined what infrastructure you had in place, what your investment priorities were, what uh, information networks you had to get information to folks and what you prioritized on the, on the other side. And so 
we're fortunate in Detroit as much as, you know, we have our challenges and we have folks who would criticize things that we haven't, haven't done today. There was not a question about the, the economic importance of black businesses. Um, it's not a feel good story here. It's not uh, the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do, but it's a critical part of our economy. And so I think folks understand it from that perspective. And then they also, you have a lot of good folks in leadership from the mayor's office to our philanthropic community on down that have demonstrated that community, that commitment in, to, in the ways that we've invested in creating access to capital, creating new dynamic, unique models, um, creating community, really building an ecosystem. And a lot of that has been supported and stimulated through um, one of my primary clients over the last seven years, New Economy Initiative, which is itself a demonstration of that commitment. It was born out of our last major economic crisis, um, the financial crisis back in 06, 07, still going on today, depending on who you ask. And to date, they've invested over $160 million in our economic, in our entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, with a focus on creating opportunity for underrepresented uh, small businesses and really pushing that work out into the neighborhoods. And so one of those programs you mentioned, Any Ideas, was part of our demonstrated commitment to while we were continuing to invest in the infrastructure, the large major organizations, the planning courses, the TA, the, you know, the, the, the funds, uh, that we also started investing directly in small businesses. Um, the community foundation here, you know, worked with NEI to make it possible for grants, philanthropic support to go directly to small businesses, not through a filter, but just directly to, because of their importance in stabilizing communities, providing uh, goods and services, in creating jobs at the neighborhood level. Uh, over that program, over the last, you know, five years of that program, we were able to invest about $3 million in direct grants to over 144 small businesses um, and had about 3,000 applicants, what became a data pool and also a group of folks that we could then funnel to some of these other service providers. Through that program, we were also able to catalyze a lot of other programs and investments like Motor City Match in Detroit Demo Day, where you now had on any given month or year in Detroit, you know, several million dollars that were up for grabs for small businesses in Detroit, in neighborhoods that weren't just the next Facebook or the next Uber, uh, where people began to believe and access um, that there was information, there was capital, there, was, there were resources available for them. So when the crisis hit, part of me said, oh my God, this thing we spent the last 15 years building is gonna get wiped out in, in 90 days. But the other part of me said, we've got people that are used to talking to each other. We've got programs that have capital already allocated that now we just need to figure out how to pivot and reallocate. We've got a commitment region-wide to making these businesses be open and survive and thrive and create jobs. And now we just have to continue to pivot those things into it. So even when you had challenges, and then we'll get into them later in the conversation about you know, some of the structural challenges of SBA and the CARES Act and the federal government and the, just the reality of how the bigger the ship, the harder it is to turn, we had some things that we could do on the ground here on day one in real time. Um, whether it was the mayor's office, uh, the, the economic development engines here like the DEGC, our philanthropic community, and even our churches and uh, community centers. We were always working and talking with each other and able to pivot in real time and do the best we could to right the ship. James, thank you so much for that. I, one thing that really strikes me as, as central to your experience is that you had that infrastructure in place, as you said, with, with the any ideas. You had that infrastructure in place and then you, you know, as you said, you pivoted and reallocated. And so whatever is fashioned in this moment in any in individual city is what can carry the city through potentially for the next crisis. Uh, you said that you began this, this infrastructure development back in the economic recession period and moved forward from there. And so, um, so I think that that's, that's an important theme to lift up. Uh, I also, I, I, it really resonates with me that 
uh, your city, your relief effort is only as equitable as your city was the day before the storm hit. I think that that is, um, that is prescient and something that might uh, open us up to our next speaker, um, uh, Lynette White Collin, who I'm pleased to introduce. She's the Vice President of Small Business Growth at the New Orleans Business Alliance, which is a public-private partnership with the city of New Orleans. It del delivers economic development for the city. Um, Lynette develops and implements strategies toward alleviating barriers for growth for business owners of color. Um, she leads Invest NOLA, which is a small business growth accelerator focused on scaling high growth potential businesses owned by ethnic minorities. And prior to joining the New Orleans Business Alliance, Lynette directed economic development programming at the Urban League of Louisiana, directing the Women's Business Center and founding the Contractors Resource Center and the Women in Business Challenge. So welcome, Lynette. Uh, I know that you understand that relief is only as equitable as your city was the day before the storm. And New Orleans certainly is no stranger to storms. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about the economic crisis or what you are experiencing uh, in terms of economic impact of COVID-19 and, um, and what your organization is doing to fashion relief? Sure, sure. So I'll just say that, you know, this pandemic could not have, ha have happened at a worse time for New Orleans. Um, let me just apologize for my voice because my allergies have kicked in and I'm about to lose my voice. <laughs> so bear with me a little. But you know, this, this um, pandemic happened at a time uh, where we were about to start our festival season, our tourism season. And New Orleans' biggest economy is tourism. And the majority of the 60% of African Americans here, you know, a large a uh, portion of them work in the hospitality sector, you know, in the restaurants, in the hotels. Um, and so Mardi Gras happened on February 25th. Um, and leading up to that, that two weeks before that, we had parades that lined the streets for miles with people standing shoulder to shoulder, screaming and having a great time, which, you know, for this pandemic, was a perfect storm. It was just a perfect, you know, opportunity for this uh, virus to spread throughout the city, unbeknownst to people here that it was spreading. Um, and so leading into what would have been the festival season for many of our culture workers, um, for many of the hospitality workers, um, we have these huge festivals that bring in a lot of tourists. Um, many of the culture workers this is like the bulk of their annual income that they make from, you know, say the end of February through, you know, the Essence Festival in July. Um, and so, of course, when this happened, we were hit pretty hard um, with people having been on the street. Um, we became a hot spot very quickly, which meant, you know, our city, you know, quickly, you know, started uh, testing, um, you know, and I think we did that well. To, to work on, on that part of it. But of course, the city had to shut down. And that meant that all of these workers, you know, and we have a hefty share of, of gig workers and cultural workers um, were out of work. Your restaurants closed, you know, all of the businesses closed that they normally would have been working in. Um, so we recognized early on, you know, even in the, the medical um, healthcare part of this, that Black people were being affected disproportionately. Um, and this pandemic just basically worsened the disparities that had already existed. So in the work that you know I was doing at NOLA BA, we were focusing on certainly all businesses of color and trying to close the racial wealth gap. You know, we focused on those of, of high growth uh, potential, but you know, very quickly we saw you know, that African Americans were being disproportionately affected by this virus. So knowing that, you know, we have such a high gig, um, um, gig worker uh, economy here, NOLA BA, my organization, we stood up um, a gig fund where eventually, you know, that fund grew to almost a million dollars where we were able to, to serve um, probably 1,700 gig workers, you know, with grants. Um, and this was like before the, the federal uh, response came in. So that was, you know, just an, a needed resource for them. 
Um, and of course, you know, as Jane said earlier, New Orleans, you know, has, we look at where we were before this pandemic, you know, and New Orleans families here, uh, household incomes were disproportionately to white families, median income, household income here was $25,000. Um, compare that to, you know, a white family here was 68,000. And we are well below the national average. So those things were already happening. When we look at the cash that is available to you know, uh, families in New Orleans, um, black families only equate to about 27 cents to every $1 for white families. So all of this was happening before this virus you know, hit New Orleans and we had to shut down our hospitality uh, economy. Um, and so, you know, in addition to uh, the gig fund, um, I think the city came out with an $18 million fund that addressed food insecurity um, and started to help some of the restaurants, you know, that we knew we would uh, have to reopen in a very limited capacity. But one of the things that the city did as well was they, um, they started a, a three day a week meeting with um, business stakeholders. Um, and so on that meeting every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we addressed the issues that were coming up, right? So in real time, you know, we have people from all over the city in different industries, you know, different organizations from philanthropy, nonprofits, and we were addressing, you know, the real issues real time as they were coming up as to, you know, what we could do to, um, to help um, folks that we're dealing with with many of those crises. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there because I know we've got a lot to um, discuss and a lot of people to, um, to talk to. Thank you so much, Lynette. And I appreciate the idea of real, real time meeting with business leaders and um, pivoting to adjust to what their needs are in the moment. Um, next, I'm thrilled to introduce Kay Sabil Rahman, the president of Demos, a dynamic think, think and do tank that powers the movement for a just, inclusive, multiracial democracy. Sabil is also an associate professor of law at Brooklyn Law School and the co-author, most recently, of Civic Power, which looks at how to build a more inclusive and empowered bottom-up democracy. His first book, Democracy Against Domination, won the Dahl Prize for Scholarship on the subject of democracy. Um, he has his academic research focuses on democracy, economic power, law, and inequality. Uh, he has an extensive bio. Um, his popular writings have, have uh, appeared in venues like The Atlantic, The New Republic, The Boston Review, and so on. He earned his law degree and doctorate at Harvard University, his master's at Oxford, uh, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. Um, Sabiel, thank you for joining us. Uh, you bring a slightly different perspective. I'm hoping that you can speak to us about some of the critical policy levers for stabilizing ec the economic circumstances and sort of writing the trajectory of wealth accumulation that we're seeing in communities of color. Uh, certainly COVID-19 requires acute uh, relief responses, but Demos has been speaking to a larger economic justice agenda. And I'm hoping that you can speak to which policy levers you believe can help with relief and what can be help, more helpful to longer term, more inclusive recovery. Yeah, great. Thanks, Elena. And thanks so much for this incredible discussion. Really grateful for the leadership and all the work that uh, our co-speakers and panelists uh, today on the call have been doing in this critical moment. We're glad to be here with you all. So um, I, let me speak to that question first by uh, just kind of reconnecting us to the through line of what we're, I hope everyone is hearing today, right? That the COVID crisis, the economic crisis, this is compounding our pre-existing structural crisis of racial violence and racial inequity, right? We have an economy and a, and a democracy that, have been, that has been premised on the extraction and exclusion of Black and Latinx communities in particular from our polity, from our economy. And all of that is sort of coming to a head, coming due uh, and becoming visible in this moment. Uh, I also want to just uh, ground us in, as we all know, I think on this call, just the um, this is an ongoing dynamic escalating crisis in real time, right? We're at the, as the pandemic continues, as the economic calamity continues, uh, we're at the cusp now of the, the kind of beginning of what is going to be a cataclysmic wave of eviction and homelessness as 30% uh, of families more at this point 
uh, couldn't meet their, couldn't pay their rent or their mortgage in the last month. That was a month ago. Uh, it's now August 3rd, right? We're gonna see what happens uh, this week, but it's not gonna be good for our communities. And so uh, we all know this, but I think just the stakes of your question, Elena, about what the policy levers are, are so, so great. And the scale of the crisis is so great that I actually think um, we start to blur the line at, between recovery and reconstruction. That actually they're, I think in a lot of ways, those are the same thing in order to actually speak to the level of devastation in black and brown communities in particular, we're going to have to rebuild from the ground up as uh, Mark Morial sort of uh, charged us to at the, t at the top of the call. So I wanna lay out three areas in particular that uh, we need to be thinking about policy wise. And I know my other co-panelists will have a lot to add to this. Uh, first is around households, then thinking second around businesses, uh, businesses and the economy, uh, so in the marketplace, uh, and third around government and our sort of larger infrastructure of, uh, of social services and, and, and public uh, stability. So on the household front, you know, the most critical thing here is first lifeline for families and households. We, uh, the Senate has uh, let our, the $600 a week unemployment insurance uh, policy that was enacted early in the summer uh, lapse. Uh, this is de already devastating. It's going to continue to be devastating, especially for black and brown communities. That lifeline has to be extended uh, sort of negotiations happening in real time on the Hill right now. Uh, but this is also where we need to think about what the new safety net looks like, right? We're gonna need to keep people protected from eviction. From, we're, we have proposals around mortgage moratoria, rent relief, uh, and uh, a whole bunch of new ideas around what the new safety net would, could be. A Central Worker Bill of Rights proposed in the Congress, for example. Uh, so these are all things that are gonna be critical to keep households afloat and ideally to build a more equitable uh, an inclusive economy going forward. The second pillar is around business and the marketplace. And we already heard uh, a bit about this from, uh, from James and, and Lynette in particular. Uh, we, part of this is about the lifeline for businesses, especially uh, black and brown businesses. I think something about something like 90% of black owned businesses were not able to access the uh, PPP protection, uh, kind of payroll protection that Congress passed earlier. Uh, so there's gonna need to be immediate support there but then how do we channel that into a longer term access to capital, to investment, uh, to the kind of supports that a lot of big uh, corporations have had uh, over the years? There's also a parallel challenge here that the pandemic actually is creating winners in this economy. And they're not the winners that we are gonna be the basis for a long-term inclusive economy going forward, right? Amazon is doing great. Uh, and that is on the backs of essential workers and on the backs of uh, a whole uh, ecosystem of small businesses and retailers uh, who are basically being uh, exploited by the platform. Uh, so we're gonna have to have an answer for the new types of, the new kind of oligarchs of the economy uh, that are coming out of this moment as well. The last plank here is about government. And because we're talking about urban policy, I know this is gonna be uh, near and dear to a lot of folks in the call here, but we have uh, over a trillion dollar shortfall when you look at state and local budgets. And we're gonna need an answer to that in the, sh in the short and in the long term. Uh, that accounts not just for the critical uh, social and public services that you've heard about already. Uh, lots of public sector on, uh, public sector employment is at risk, right, as this continues. Uh, and the whole ecosystem infrastructure of uh, delivering services to communities, what uh, Alien started us off talking about, uh, that's, gonna, that's the survival of that infrastructure, which if anything needs to grow in this moment, right, is premised on uh, the combination of resources, public and private, that are flowing in to the front line. So, there's a lot to dig in there. Let me toss it back to you uh, for this next round of discussion. Thank you so much, Sabil. So I know that it's, it's taking us a while to unpack all of these issues um, and present all of the great work that you're doing. So I'm gonna ask, I'm just gonna ask one general follow-up question and I'm, then I'm gonna turn it over to the respondents because I think uh, our goal here is to really invite a dialogue amongst the practitioners um, and engage our audience. So, uh, you know, Helene, I'm going to come back to you because I know that you have a new initiative and building off of what Sabil has mentioned with helping to uh, fashion and engineer new approaches to move from relief to recovery. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you think we need to do to ensure that our recovery efforts are more equitable? We know that relief was was building the ship and, and sailing it or building the plane and flying at the same time, but given a moment to think about where we're gonna go forward and knowing this crisis is going to continue to escalate, what does recovery look like? Yeah, well, you know, I think all of the comments that people have made kind of 
um, follow into what should recovery look like. So, you know, first of all, if we're going to have an equitable recovery, it needs to be grounded in the reality of the lives of uh, communities and families who have been left out of economic opportunity for far too long and who were the most hard hit by this uh, crisis. And so, you know, in, in Chicago, uh, where we have um, essentially one third white, one third Latinx, one third African American, it's the African American and Latinx communities that have been hard hit. And that ultimately, if we want to move forward as a uh, city and a region, you can't do that if two thirds of your population is left out of economic opportunity. So, you know, we see this in, as an imperative, not only because we believe it's the right thing to do um, and that we, that, that we really ought to be focusing on those communities, but it's also just kind of uh, economically, the only way that we're going to continue to move forward is if we do make sure that all communities have the opportunity and particularly two thirds of your population are black and brown, we've got to pay attention to that. You know, and I think um, one of the things that um, is encouraging, if you will, coming out of this experience is that we're doing things differently that we said we couldn't do before. So getting cash into people's hands, um, it has made a huge impact. You know, data are coming out now to show that we're not having the debt and credit crisis that we might have had or had in the um, the recovery of 2008 um, because people actually had money to spend to pay for their basic necessities. Um, and so, you know, why not build on that and look at what does that mean for recovery? And what does that mean for longer term policies around cash as an important part uh, to shoring up households that have financial um, instability? So, you know, I think uh, efforts around getting small business, getting loans to small businesses. We all know that they were not uh, perfect to say the least, but it's got us started on looking at what are the kinds of systems that we need to build so that small businesses are able to take uh, advantage of programs like this. And so I think going into a recovery, we've started already building these ecosystems that help small businesses get access to banking relationships that they didn't have, as an example. So let's, you know, let's build on that. You know, we're, um, we've done a lot of things here in sh Chicago around the digital divide because of so many children who were out of school um, and needed um, long, the ability to have distance learning. So we have set up a whole infrastructure for getting hotspots out to neighborhoods that didn't have um, internet access along with making sure that, that children have the equipment. We could do much more around that. And we know that as we've gotten um, internet access to kids, it's also given their parents internet access so that they can do some of the important things that they need. You know, protection for part-time and gig workers that came with this, where we have always looked only at people who have W-2 payroll um, as ways of supporting. So, you know, I could go on and on, but I think if we look at, you know, put as our, as our focus as we go into this, who's been most hard hit? What are some of the immediate kind of programmatic things we can do, but what are the policy levers? Because we know that poor public policy is why we are where we are today. And I think there's so much possibility to take some of the lessons that we learned and the things that we were willing to do in an emergency situation and then start extending those longer term. Those are such great and important points. I, I think what we should do is go ahead and because we're a little bit past time, I think we should go ahead and turn it over to our respondents. Um, I'm hoping that they'll ask some of the questions that I would have otherwise asked our panelists. Um, so uh, we're gonna ask our, our uh, respondents uh, I'm pleased to introduce Vincent Ash, who's the Director of Economic Development at the Indianapolis Chamber of Commerce, Lauren Counts, who's the Senior Director and Head of National Programs at Capital Impact Partners, Ashley Gardier, who's the Senior Advisor to the President and CEO uh, uh, and Director of All in Cities at PolicyLink, and Samuel Nadali, 
who is the Director of Employer Inclusivity at the Center for Economic Inclusion in Minneapolis. Um, Vincent, I'm gonna turn it over to you for a question and for some reflections on the experience that you have, have had in Indianapolis. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and uh, thank you for allowing me to be on here today. Um, I could say from an Indianapolis standpoint, um, we we have seen um, our hospitality service industry hit hard, similar to everybody else um, here on this call. Um, I would say, I think the, the benefit from us is that we are pretty diverse from an industry standpoint across the board. So while our hospitality industry did, um, and service industry, restaurant industry did, did take a hit, um, logistics, um, life sciences, you know, was, was able to stay um, pretty well and able to grow during this time. But we seen really um, that affected the most was small businesses. And we knew that going in right when, you know, we had orders, you know, to shut down, stay at home and quarantine, um, that small business was going to be affected to most. Um, as an Indy Chamber, we're wholeheartedly, you know, want to work with businesses and support businesses and give them access to as many resources as possible. Um, so we did launch um, a few things. We, want, we launched a response hub to be able to give businesses um, resources in a timely manner in all in one fashion or even to get detailed questions answered from you know I, IU Kelly School of Business or the Indiana Bar Association for pro bono uh, for free um, and we did also launch um, some loan loan programs uh, so we did do a traditional loan program very low interest 3.75 percent and we was able to do that in a pretty equitable fashion 64% um, went to XB businesses with 29 percent of those being black businesses um, as well um, once, you know, the first round of PPP kind of uh, went out, uh, we did start strategizing and being strategic about how we can participate in the second round of the payroll protection program. Um, so we did do a partnership with a uh, CDFI um, in, um, in our city um, to be able to, and with the city of Indianapolis to be able to administer uh, payroll protection um, loans. Overall, um, we we have put out about seven and a half million dollars um, for a little bit over four in our traditional lending and then right about, about 3.5 um, in our payroll protection plan uh, and program. 76% um, of the loans that we have for our, our payroll protection uh, program uh, went to XBEs with 37% of that being black owned businesses. Um, so I think overall from an equitable fashion, we did, we did a pretty good job. There's definitely a lot more to do. Um, but we was able to do that by concentrating on very small businesses, 50 employees or less. Um, and we was able to capture a lot of sole proprietors. And then I really think that's what really helped us with our demographics um, and, our, and our loan pipelines. Um, so I, I believe that's enough about Indianapolis. So my question really to the panel is, um, as, we, as I spoke on you know, the payroll protection program, you know, we, we, all, we all are aware that a lot of uh, black and brown business, minority business owners was left out of that process. What do you think could have been done differently from a federal level or from a, a financial institution level to basically give access to this program to a lot of uh, black and uh, brown business owners? I'm going to let anyone, uh, any of the panelists who want to jump in to respond to that question, what could have been done better or as we were thinking through going forward, what can be done to make sure that we are, that the funds are reaching the intended community members or the ones that we would intend to receive the benefits? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so I know a lot of us know these stats as practitioners, but I'll just kind of throw it out because we dealt with this in real time in Detroit. As the facts were coming out and the realities of how this capital is going to be deployed, um, if you work in this work, you know that pre-COVID, nine out of 10 SBA loans went to white male led companies. That's just the data that they share. Um, the loans also, as the distribution channel is set up, were gonna be distributed through banks, not directly through the SBA. And banks were only gonna work with their existing customers as a way for them to handle the deluge of applications and processing that was coming in. And so when you look at how most black and brown companies start, they don't start with bank loans. We know why, but they don't. Um, so that, that just set of facts just put in motion certain things that weren't going to happen in, 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 on the onset of this crisis. Not right or wrong, just structurally, we realized early on that, that, that 
we were going to advocate as much as we could, but even the bankers I talked to that were friends were like, this is how, this is how we're doing it. And, and so that was the challenge. So, you know, long-term you've got to work to make the SBA and those pathways, you know, address those barriers systematically as to why those stats are the way they are and why those relationships aren't there and what infrastructure do we need to help create either within the businesses or at scale so that every sole proprietor or two or three person business doesn't have to become an SBA lending expert. And that was just kind of a, I don't want to call it a blind spot of our ecosystem, but of the steps of the many things that we were addressing, I think for a lot of us, quite frankly, SBA just wasn't at the top of our lending pool because of some of those challenges that we had to overcome and we were kind of creating our own lanes. But when you look at the own lanes, you know, like I work with the New Economy Initiative, we're you know, 160 million over 13 years, which sounds like a great amount of funds, but we just deployed through two rounds of the CARES Act, four trillion over six months. And so if you took every philanthropic endowment across the nation, Kresge, Knight, Rockefeller, all of them, you know, do you even get to one trillion? No, over a lifetime of giving. And so when you just have to now, you know, you've got an election year, you've got you know, we had senators and Congress folks come to the table and say, well, what can we do? And they host the webinars and all these things. But, you know, at, at what point do we actually, we as the practitioners present the game plan for saying, here's what happened. I understand you couldn't change it in April, but if this still happens over the next two, three, four, five years, here's what we're gonna look like as a community. And so, you know, and that's one part of it. The other part of it, I think, which goes beyond these loans is what are we loaning into? Because we have businesses right now that we have to also do some of the other stewardship on of how do we not just loan them into a cliff, but prepare them to participate in the new economy as it is created and as we create it. As uh, Casey Bill mentioned, there are winners right now in this disaster recovery. A lot of us weren't prepared to pivot or didn't know how to pivot or where to pivot. We were still trying to convince a lot of folks to claim their Google Plus listings. And we were fighting to bring more, you know, residents to the neighborhood for local mom and pop brick and mortars. If, if our businesses are dependent on that economy and that revenue stream to survive, they will die. So we have to quickly at scale get folks prepared to understand how to deal with shifting demographics in the neighborhoods, how to deal with shifting consumer habits, you know, not just ordering online or curbside or e-commerce, but how do you have an expanded customer base? How do you create different types of revenue streams for your business? How do you understand how to restructure your business? You know, we have so much shame about failure within our community or even something like taking unemployment or, or, or filing for bankruptcy, you, you know, look at Saks Fifth Avenue, look at Nordstrom's, look at Men's Warehouse, look at all these different major corporations that understand different financial tools, you know, of how to restructure, eliminate debt, create effective balance sheets, pivot their business models when needed. You know, we've got to not just teach to being competitive 10 years ago, but understanding that what being competitive looks like is gonna change month over month, year over year going into the future. Yeah. That's the short version. Yeah, I, I just want to jump in really quick, uh, really uh, uh, echo and agree with all of what James was laying out. It's so important. Uh, two additional uh, uh, data points to add, you know, with the, with the way the, the PPP uh, program was structured, it flowed through banks, uh, banks, as James described. Banks claimed anywhere from 20 to $30 billion in fees just on the processing alone. So not only did the money not make it to the communities that need it most, that is just skimmed off the top. If we were building from scratch, right, we would have, what would it look like if you had, uh, if every small business and black and brown owned business had an account at the Fed that, where they could get that money directly the way all the big banks have been able to get support bailouts, you know, under the table. What would it look like if we had that infrastructure built, right? That $24 billion, that's, you know, we can do the math, but that's, you know, half a million jobs over the next year. It's, it's a lot of dollars, right? Just on fees alone. Um, and then the, the last thing to add here, um, 
uh, mentioning about sort of uh, getting our businesses up and up and running for the new economy, what you're saying, James, uh, there, you know, private equity is, is waiting poised in this moment, right? There's been a lot of coverage about a lot of venture funds and uh, private equity funds that are uh, trying to buy up businesses that are failing in this moment to sort of add to their portfolios. And that's another pool of capital that actually, you know, is being used to further ex extract wealth from black and brown communities. That those dollars need to be going into businesses the way James was just describing a moment ago. And I would just add to, you know, what both have said, totally agree. I think that if there were clear goals set out for this, we would design the right program. And there were no real goals. There was just the notion that we not need to get dollars out. And I think it's one of the things that, and then whoever was best positioned to get those dollars got those dollars. And I think one of the things moving from kind of this response to recovery is really thinking about what metrics do we put in place? What are the goals of these programs? So that what we do really designs for the, the audiences that we really want to reach. And I think that's you know, something that we can do as we think about recovery is being much more deliberate about making sure we're designing programs that meet the targets that we feel will, will bring the most equity into this. And, so and we've got to make sure that our, we have to make sure that our legislators are, you know, keen as to, you know, who these policies have to work for, right? Because, you know, as, as you said, the fees that the banks generated from doing these loans, it made sense for a bank to do one $10 million loan that they would have gotten the same fee for doing 50, you know, less than a million dollar loan. So it just made perfect sense for that to happen, you know, and there's not too many small businesses that have a $5 million a month payroll, which is what this, this program equated to, you know, a $10 million cap. So if the intention was really for small businesses, there should have been a much smaller cap. You know, the, the fee should, should not have been structured the way they were to make it favorable for the banks to go after much larger loans. Okay, thank you. And I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren for Lauren Counts uh, with Capital Impact Partners for her question and reflections on experiences in Washington, D.C. Thank you and thanks so much for having me today and um, inspired by all of your work uh, listening here today. Um, in Washington, D.C., um, we have seen uh, a lot of response from the local and regional governments in our jurisdictions. So uh, we've seen uh, D.C. had $25 million microgrant program, Montgomery, Fairfax, Arlington counties in Virginia and Maryland um, came, came up with some very fast money. And uh, as a community development financial institution, I have seen how critical those funds are in addition to the federal response. And CDFIs that we work with actually channeled um, $10 million in the last few weeks through PPP and microgrant programs, which have been essential in helping these struggling small businesses stay afloat. And we've seen also particularly the retail and the food sectors have been so impacted by this crisis, just struggling to keep, keep their doors open while they're also dealing with the same childcare issues that we're all facing, um, you know, having to deal with their lives as well as keeping their businesses afloat. And we've seen businesses pivoting, you know, from being uh, selling baked goods to selling flour you know, buying trucks to get the food to communities, um, and then some nonprofits who have been channeling micro grants and donations. So I'm particularly interested, um, James and Lynette, what you've seen in your communities uh, with these high performing nonprofits, and how do we, in the next iteration in the recovery, ensure that they're part of the conversation, ensure that they're getting funding so that they can um, really provide that distribution channel for the funding that's going to need to continue. Thanks. Yeah, so um, we work um, uh, fairly closely with, with our CDFI community here. As a matter of fact, in the program that I run, we have a consortium of three um, CDFIs here that are all led by uh, people of color. Um, the intent of, of this program was really to be able to loan more money to the businesses that really needed it and to come up with a product, you know, that would 
you know, help them in the way our businesses operate it. Um, and so, you know, we've seen that the CDFIs have definitely come to the rescue, you know, even um, with these PPP loans, we actually partnered with a couple of our CDFIs here. In addition to that, we also part brought in our um, ESOs, our entrepreneurial support organizations, where we actually paid them to help our business owners to put together those applications. And then those applications were submitted through these CDFIs. So we were able to make sure that over 250 you know, very small minority owned businesses were able to get access to that PPP, um, which we knew if we had not done that concerted effort, that wouldn't have happened. So we, we really do have to make sure that they are at the table because it is critical. We cannot rely on the banks to make sure that our businesses are getting the resources, you know, and the, and the monies that they need. Um, but these uh, CDFIs are also standing up, you know, other loan funds that you know are, are proving to be very beneficial to the business owners here. So, you know, my organization with the businesses that we've worked with, you know, we have worked with them around pivoting strategies. Um, we actually have developed a new training program that we're deploying next month to really focus on those critical issues that the businesses should be focusing on right now. You know, pivoting strategies, you know, uh, cash management. Um, even exit strategies. This may be the time for you to look at whether your business should be filing bankruptcy, right? Or maybe you should be positioning your business to be bought by another company. Um, so those strategies that I don't think our businesses are really focused on, you know, is where the nonprofits can really step up and provide that kind of training and information and resources. And then working with our neighborhood communities to make sure that we, we have a pulse on what's happening in the communities so that we're able to address those immediate needs. So I try to share a lot of stuff really quickly. Um, one of the things, there's a couple of, again, back to infrastructure. Um, one of the things that we had launched in Detroit in the last two years was COAC, which is our Center for Nonprofit Innovation, where there was actually an incubator focused on providing information, technical assistance, and coaching to nonprofits. And so Again, when the crisis hit, we had that infrastructure that could focus on PPP access, pivoting, scaling, coaching for nonprofits, and that was closely tied to our entrepreneurial ecosystem as well. Um, one of the things that, you know, of the myriad of things that we were able to do, you had some kind of strong performers like our, our tech town, which is tied to our university, so it's got some funding base in place. They were able to really, you know, kind of take the helm on focusing on, um, I don't like to say low income, but they, they developed a grant product that was quickly available for uh, entrepreneurs with 80% area AMI. So it was really focused to say, okay, we know PPP is gonna be happening up here. Let's develop some quick funds right now for folks right here at the sole proprietor level, at the, you know, just, you know, really getting started level. Um, we were in the midst of, um, this was going to be really a kind of a banner year for Detroit, a, kind of a victory lap of sorts. And we had a campaign going called In Good Co. Detroit, which was a storytelling campaign about all of our great entrepreneurs, and we, you know, over the years and their success stories. And it quickly became clear to us in March, nobody wanted to hear about success stories. Nobody wanted to be inspired. People needed to know how to survive. So we pivoted this into a place for real-time pivoting so we can provide peer-to-peer -peer, uh, information on how entrepreneurs were handling the crisis uh, and also a source for information. So we developed a COVID-19 landing page that just put up front, here are all the different changing daily. And if you remember, you know, in March and in April, every day we're getting a new announcement, a new grant program, and a lot of our frontline service providers were trying to provide services, but also aggregate this information every day. And so what we were able to do through NEI and Good Co. is just take on that aggregation role. We had the infrastructure, we had the tech, and I could host a weekly call and then just tell people, send me stuff via message, screenshot, text message, whatever. We'll put kind of the, the daily bill up. Here are the grants, here are the webinars, here's the great, latest analysis of the CARES Act. Oh, here's a great resource from McKinsey Co. that you might not have heard of. And here's a Goldman Sachs investors call info. And so we were able to kind of serve as that intermediary for gathering information, 
as well as helping folks understand what other people were doing in real time so everybody could have their own lane in solving the problem. Um, Perfect. Um, James, yes. if, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you there only because we have a little bit less than 20 minutes left. Two more questions to ask from respondents and also questions from the audience. But I hear you about the importance of the repository of information. That information is key and power in this moment. So thank you for sharing that and lifting that one up. Um, I, before we turn to the, our remaining two respondents, Samuel, Samuel Nidali uh, from Minneapolis and Ashley Gardier uh, with PolicyLink. Molly, I'm gonna ask you if you could uh, share a couple of questions that have come in from the, uh, the chat, from our audience um, in the chat. Sure, thanks so much. And to everyone in the chat, if we don't get to your questions on air, we'll make sure and share them with the panelists offline and share the responses across this whole community we're creating. So very quickly, I actually have like a visual poll for everyone on the panel, speakers and respondents alike. Uh, Dory Rand raised the issue of bias and uh, discrimination in small business lending and PPP that NCRC has done um, some matched pair testing and some studies on that. So I'd love to see a show of hands. Um, how many of you are thinking about or supporting kind of further testing or litigation uh, to kind of really flesh out whether or not this discrimination is happening, we believe it is, and how it's happening. Is anybody pushing on that? Give me like a wave of the hands if, if litigation around discrimination and PPP is on your mind. See some nodding, see some nodding. Um, Sabil, you seem to be furrowing your brow. Anything you want to add to that that's specific? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to take up too much time, but I, I think um, there's, you know, statewide, there's a lot of room. I think there's going to be a lot of need for this kind of statewide innovation. I think that's true, but this goes back to some of the uh, public sector budgeting questions that I was mentioning earlier, right? The, where uh, state governments and local governments are also seeing their re resources crater. And, at a, and so this is part of the thing to balance, right? Is that we need to leverage all the creativity we can at the local state and local level, because it's the scale the problem demands it. And we're gonna need national scale resources to even do that type of innovation, right? So ideally we would have that one-two punch, local creativity with federal resources flowing right into our state and local policymakers and, and sort of the public private infrastructures that we've talked about here. But you know, this is not gonna be something that even the, the most um, creative local leaders are gonna be able to handle without those federal dollars eventually. Sure, oh. and again, we'll hope that the panelists can add to that um, after the after the event, but uh, one last question from the audience before we pivot back to our respondents. And actually, Lynette, I'm going to come to you because you talked a little bit about kind of the social and emotional toll that all of this uh, has taken at hitting New Orleans just when it did. And uh, we've had a question about the, the mental health of entrepreneurs, especially entrepreneurs of color who are, are getting it from all sides. Do you know of any programs? Uh, do you have your site set on any programs that are supporting people's mental health as they also try to maintain their business? Yeah, and, and we, we have discussed that quite a bit, um, you know, on our business committee meetings, um, just because we know it, 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 it's, it's a real issue. Um, there are a couple of organizations here in New Orleans, you know, that um, have taken that on, you know, and have uh, reached out to individuals and the business community, you know, to come in and, and seek help. Um, for, for those, you know, mental health issues that they may be having. But, you know, being an entrepreneur is a lonely life anyway, right? And so when you add this, you know, COVID situation, we're on lockdown, you're in your home, you know, it's panic time because you've got a business to run, you don't have income coming in, you don't know, you know, there's so many uncertainties that, you know, you can't control and you're feeling out of control. And, and it is, you know, critically important and it is one of the places that you know we've we've been talking a lot about. But there are two um, organizations here: um, an Institute for Mental Hygiene um, and um, the Metropolitan Human uh, Service uh, folks here. Uh, they've reached out. They've done some public service announcements, you know, to make sure that people know that these resources are available. You know, and like James, you know, we've set up a repository on the website to you know, be able to let people know where these resources are and where they can go, um, you know, to tap into that. Thank you so much, Annette. Uh, Elena, I want to come back to you for the other respondents. Okay, and I want to thank our viewing audience. I know those questions came in from Dory Rand from Chicago and Mike Tamale uh, from Minneapolis-St. Paul to 
uh, two partners and supporters of Urban America Forward over the years. Um, I want to turn it over to Samuel Ned Lee, uh, the Director of, an employ of Employer Inclusivity at the Center for Economic Inclusion in Minneapolis. Samuel, can you be, try to be brief in explaining the experience, but also if you can share your question with uh, the panelists. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, um, Elena. Um, so yes, um, I am born and raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And as you all know, um, this is the incident where, this is the epicenter of where George Floyd and, and all of um, the uprising and things have happened during our COVID period. Um, there's been many issues with police brutality prior to that moment, but I think that with considering everything that was going on, tipped everybody over the edge and, and now we're in this moment. Um, and it's, oh, Minneapolis is also a very unique um, place when it comes to um, having a number of Fortune 500 companies headquartered here. We have about 17 headquartered here in the Twin Cities area. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity. However, there's, we're one of the, cities with the largest disparities between whites and blacks. And um, one of the things that I wanted to ask the, uh, and at the Center of Economic Inclusion, uh, really what we are, we're a cross-sector organization that's committed to strengthening the, um, the region's infrastructure um, to, with collect with collective capacity to disrupt these systems that are set up that created these disparities. Um, so really what I wanted to ask the, the, the group of uh, panelists is, um, in your city, um, have you, do you have relationships with these companies um, that are employing a lot of our, our a lot of people in our community? Um, Robert Smith, I forgot to mention this part. My apologies. I'm trying to make this question as brief as possible. Uh, Robert Smith um, had uh, put out on the Forbes. Um, he talked about a two two percent. Um, um, initiative, which essentially is companies providing 2% of their net profits to um, CDFIs. We talked about CDFIs and, and black owned banks, um, which have those relationships with these black entrepreneurs. Um, do you have you ever thought about how we can get more of these companies involved in, in maybe something like that? I'd be happy to say a couple words about that. I mean, I, you know, um, one of the things I was going to come back to um, from one of my earlier statements is, you know, we've put a lot of focus on public policy change, and I think that's critical. On the other hand, I think there's a lot more that the, the private sector can do um, to really um, make a difference and have an economic impact at this moment. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, one of the things is we've been thinking about the um, recovery fund that, that, that we're envisioning it isn't just a dollar fund. It isn't just how many dollars can we raise for programmatic efforts, but it's also how can we incorporate the private sector to really be part of the solution and thinking differently around how they can interact and engage with communities of color. And so, you know, you give the example of Robert Smith, there's a lot that corporations could do based on how they spend their dollars. And, you know, he has some very specific things around dollars to CDFIs and um, procurement and use of um, services um, that are businesses owned by people of color, et cetera. And I think there's a lot that could be done on that side. But, you know, we also know job creation and looking at, you know, are we making sure that jobs that are the jobs of the future and high growth uh, jobs are jobs that are being prioritized for communities of color. Lending, we've all talked about, you know, lending consistently. Well, that's banks, <laughs> you know, that's the private sector. How do we get banks to think differently about how they lend? You know, we know that insurers in communities of color don't insure in ways that, um, you know, allow businesses that have hard times to have the same kind of insurance coverage. So, you know, could we work with insurance companies? So, I, you know, there's, there are a lot, there's a whole agenda, if you will, for the private sector. And we are working very closely with the private sector here in Chicago. We have a, a, a coalition called the Corporate Coalition, for instance, that is trying to look at how what they do can be more aligned with some of these broader initiatives. And so I, you know, I definitely, there's a whole agenda that needs to be thought through as we look both at the public sector and policy levers, but also how the private sector can enter into this. And obviously we know that private capital 
besides taxes is the only renewable source of capital we have. And if we can use that and deploy that in ways that really focus on this equity agenda, you know, I think that we can accomplish a lot. If, do I have a second, Elena, or you keep moving? Just one. Okay, uh, <laughs> just to throw out quick, three quick examples of how we have done that here. Uh, Casey Bill, you mentioned earlier about banks and, and the fees collected. So CCF Bank here took a billion dollars in fees that they collected through PPP loan processing and created a, a loan fund for minority entrepreneurs. So that's a billion dollars they put on the table. Uh, we've got a Detroit Needs Business Consortium right now where all the major corporate partners in the region are at the table working to invest their time, talent, and tra treasure in moving small businesses forward from procurement to all the different ways that they can support. Um, and then the, uh, Rock Ventures is now in their fourth year of Detroit Demo Day uh, where they're investing a million dollars in 0% interest loans to these short small businesses. I've helped build that program. I was a participant in it in helping some of my clients achieve funding and I've also served as a juror. It's one of the few funding sources that, you know, no guarantees, no personal guarantees, very low barrier. You just show up, you compete uh, and, and, and the winner circle they've created really speaks for itself. So a lot of those things could be scaled uh, but they've been, there's a lot of folks who have done a great job in creating those access and good models that exist that we can share. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. And so ne next I'm going to turn it over. I'm, I'm sorry, Lynette, if you, if you wouldn't mind, let me, let's turn it over to Ashley Gardier with Policy Link. She's going to ask her final question, but I think it will provide an opportunity uh, both to share her reflections about what they're seeing at Policy Link with all in cities and also some ideas for some final remarks about bold moves uh, for next steps. So Ashley Gardier, Senior Advisor to the President and CEO and Director of All In Cities at Policy Link. Awesome, thank you guys so much for letting me listen um, and participate in what has been truly an inspiring conversation. At Policy Link, we focus on advancing liberating policies and we center the 100 million people of, of people in uh, America who are living in or near poverty, uh, most of whom are people of color. Uh, the panelists have outlined um, really from the beginning that the racial wealth gap um, was created by design um, through policies and systems, which mean that um, our focus on equity and our ability to get to a just economy um, requires that we change the rules and then create equity by design. Um, essentially, this is going to require us um, to respond to the immediate needs, I call them the right now demands of the more than 100 million, um, while we work aggressively uh, towards structural changes that our founder, Angela Glover Blackwell, uh, tells us requires radical imagination. So my questions uh, for the panel, uh, how can we provide access to healthcare, food and emergency supplies and advocate for delayed evictions due to COVID, uh, like our partners in Contra Costa County, while we build a shared agenda for full access to healthcare and housing and technology. Uh, in our economy work, can we stabilize incomes for hospitality and gig workers uh, and provide relief funds to entrepreneurs of color while we build a shared agenda for a federal job guarantee that invests in our region's next economies, delivering good jobs, and living wages uh, for all in our democracy work. Can we demand inclusive processes, excuse me, uh, to help shape the equitable deployment of COVID resources while we build power to change the rules of the game and ensure voting rights for all? Uh, last week, our housing team published two papers with recommendations to ensure uh, racial equity and uh, inclusion in the deployment of COVID resources. I'll put that in the chat box. Um, but finally, in our corporate sector, can we make the near-term investments in movement leaders and design new HR uh, policies and practices that are actively anti-racist while we write new rules of capitalism, uh, really establishing diverse investment teams, making investments in Black entrepreneurs and businesses that benefit uh, Black markets. So at PolicyLink, we believe that we can and we must address both the right now and the radical aspirations because of the scale that our poor, well not poor, 
uh, the very strong policies that this country has been built on um, require. Um, so shifting from fixing people and small policies um, and systems to now deliver at a scale that would serve the 100 million uh, in America who are living at or near poverty. Thank you so much for letting me listen and respond. Ashley, thank you for that. I think what we're going to do is allow your question to be a rhetorical one and to serve as our challenge as we move forward. Because I think that each of the panelists has, has shared how they are, uh, how they are implement, implementing acute relief efforts, but also uh, aiming toward that, um, that, that renewed infrastructure, an infrastructure that actually serves all of our, the members of our community who are vulnerable and thinking through new and different and better, not just building the same or rebuilding the same fabric uh, that got us in the situation in the first place. So I'm gonna leave, leave your question as a rhetorical one for us all to consider as we move forward in these conversations. And I'm gonna thank, uh, I'm gonna thank all of our panelists and all of our respondents for their expertise, for their time, and importantly, for their great work on behalf of the communities that we care about in urban America. Um, I want to I want to thank our, our partners, um, uh, New America, Indianapolis, and the National Urban League. Um, and I also, of course, want to thank our sponsors, the Kresge Foundation and E.E. Casey Foundation. I invite you all to, uh, to participate in this ongoing conversation. The, uh, the Urban America Forward uh, COVID-19 Equitable Relief and Recovery Series will take place every three weeks from now until October 5th. Um, so mark August 24th, September 14th, and October 5th on your calendars. The next program will focus on some of those critical questions that you raised, Ashley, with regard to housing and eviction moratoriums, housing relief, um, and rental and mortgage relief. Um, on September 14th, we are going to focus on public-private partnerships and what we are doing to, with and through public-private partnerships to uh, invest in lives and livelihoods. And that will raise many of the questions that, um, that Helene shared with us or many of the uh, solutions that Helene shared with us and um, uh, exploration of the ways that corporate America as well can come to the table. And on October 5th, we'll be talking about the future of urban America. What will it look like post COVID as we are seeing migration out of our urban centers, as we're seeing our innovation economies uh, pack and run to places where they can provide distance, uh, distance work um, and, and at cheaper rent. Uh, and we're seeing some young professionals move out of our cities. What will that mean for tax base, our services, uh, our uh, security and safety and our education. Uh, so please mark your calendars and plan to join us uh, for those conversations. Um, and with that, I believe that takes us to the close of our program. Um, I want to let you know that this video, the video of this recording will be featured on the New America YouTube site and on Urban America Forward, um, our website. Uh, we will also be sure to share a summary brief uh, in the highlights from this conversation with you. Um, and again, thank you to our partners. Thank you to our illustrious panelists and respondents. Um, and everyone, thank you for the work that you are doing to ensure that COVID-19 relief is equitable and, and get us to a more inclusive uh, economic recovery. Thank you very much. <laughs>